Chapter 43, The Mummy. Oh, the mummy was mentioned before. Remember when Richard was in Newgate and first met the Resurrection Man? And he was saying that his, um, his mother was known as the mummy and she was the one who was going to send him a package at Newgate that Richard was supposed to get for him. Um, but who knows if it was actually his mom or if it was someone else. But, oh, this is about to get bad. I have a feeling. Okay. The district of Spitalfields and Bethnal Green was totally unknown to Markham. Oh, no. Indeed, his visit upon the present occasion was the first he had ever paid to that densely populated and miserable region. It was now midnight and the streets were nearly deserted. The lamps, few and far between, only made darkness visible instead of throwing a useful light upon the intricate maze of narrow thoroughfares. Markham's object was to reach Shoreditch as soon as possible, for he knew that opposite the church there was a cab stand where he might procure a vehicle to take him home. Emerging from Brick Lane, he crossed Church Street and struck into that labyrinth of dirty and dangerous lanes in the vicinity of Birdcage Walk, which we alluded to at the commencement of the preceding chapter. He soon perceived that he had mistaken his way. Oh, no. And at length found himself floundering about in a long, narrow street, unpaved, and here and there almost blocked up with heaps of putrescent filth. There was not a lamp in this perilous thoroughfare. No moon on high irradiated his path. Black night enveloped everything above and below in total darkness. And he's being followed by the resurrection man, remember? Oh. Once or twice he thought he heard footsteps behind him, and then he stopped, hoping to be overtaken by someone of whom he might inquire his way. But either his ears deceived him, or else the person whose steps he heard stopped when he did. There was not a light in any of the houses on either side, and not a sound of revelry or sorrow escaped from the ill-closed casements. Richard was bewildered, and to speak truly, he began to be alarmed. He remembered to have read of the mysterious disappearance of persons in the east end of the metropolis, and also of certain tell deeds of crime which had been lately brought to light in the very district where he was now wandering, and he could not help wishing that he was in some more secure and less gloomy region. He was groping his way along, feeling with his hands against the houses to guide him, now knee-deep in some filthy puddle, now stumbling over some heap of slimy dirt, now floundering up to his ankles in the mud, when a heavy and crushing blow fell upon his hat from behind. <gasps> Richard! He staggered and fell against the door of a house, almost at the same instant that the door was thrust open and two powerful arms hurled the prostrate young man down three or four steps into a passage. The person who thus ferociously attacked him leapt after him, closing the door violently behind him. All this occupied but a couple of seconds, and though Markham was not completely stunned by the blow, he was too much stupefied by the suddenness and violence of the assault to cry out. To this circumstance, he was probably indebted for his life, for the villain who had struck him no doubt conceived the blow to have been fatal, and therefore, instead of renewing the attack, he strode over Markham and entered a room into which the passage opened. <gasps> Is he in another murder house? <laughs> Yikes! Only Eliza were there. She knows how to get out of them. <laughs> Richard's first idea was to rise and attempt an escape by the front door, but before he had time to consider it, even for a moment, the murderous ruffian struck a light in the room, which, as well as a part of the passage, was immediately illuminated by a powerful glare. Markham had been thrown down, thrown upon the damp tiles with which the passage was paved, in such a manner that his head was close by the door of the room. The man who had assailed him lighted a piece of candle in a bright tin shade hanging against the wall, and the reflection produced by the metal caused the strong glare that fell so suddenly upon Richard's eyes. Markham was about to start from his prostrate position when the interior of that room was thus abruptly revealed to him, but for a few moments the spectacle which met his sight paralyzed every limb and rendered him breathless, speechless, and motionless with horror. Stretched upon a stretcher, upon a shutter, with three chairs supported. Okay. Stretched upon a shutter, which three chairs supported, was a corpse. Naked and of that bluish or livid color which denotes the beginning of decomposition. Near this loathsome object was a large tub full of water, and to that part of the ceiling immediately above it were affixed two large hooks, to each of which hung thick cords. In one corner of the room were long, flexible iron rods, spades, pickaxes, wooden levers, coils of thick rope, trowels, saws, hammers, huge chisels, skeleton keys, etc. But how great was Richard's astonishment when glancing from the objects just described towards the ruffian who had hurled him into that den of horrors, his eyes were struck by the somber and revolting countenance of the resurrection man. He closed his eyes for a moment as if, this, as if he could thus banish both thought and danger. 
Now then, mummy, said the resurrection man, come and hold this light while I rifle the pockets of a new subject. Scarcely had he uttered these words when a low knock was heard at the front door of the resurrection house. Here are these fellows come for the stiffen, cried the resu resurrection man aloud. These words struck fresh dismay into the soul of Richard Markham, for it instantly occurred to him that any friends of the resurrection man who were thus craving admittance were more likely to aid than to frustrate that villain's signs upon the life and property of a fellow creature. Here, mummy, cried the resurrection man once more, and hastily returning into the passage, he reiterated his summons at the bottom of a staircase at the further end. Here, mummy, why don't you come down? I'm a coming, I'm a coming, answered a cracked female voice from the top of the staircase, and in another moment an old, blear-eyed, shriveled hag made her appearance. She was so thin, her eyes so sunken, her skin was so much like dirty parchment, and her entire, entire appearance was so horrible and repulsive that it was impossible to conceive a more appropriate and expressive nickname than the one which had been conferred upon her. And mummy is M-U-M-M-Y, not like mommy. It's mummy. So, like a mummy. <laughs> Come now, mummy, said the ruffian in a hasty whisper. Help me to drag this fellow into the back room. Here, there's good pickings here, and the chaps have come for the stiffen. Another knock was heard at the door. Markham, well aware that resistance was at present vain, exercised sufficient control over himself to remain motionless, with his eyes nearly closed while the resurrection man and the mummy dragged him hastily into the back room. The mummy turned the key in the lock while the resurrection man hurried to the street door and admitted two men into the front apartment. One was Tom the Cracksman. <gasps> He's back. The other was a rogue of the same stamp and was known amongst his confederates in crime by the name of the Buffer. It was this man's boast that he never robbed anyone without stripping him to the very skin, and as a person in a state of nudity is said to be in buff, the origin of his pseudonym is easily comprehended. Well, said the cracksman sulkily, you ain't at all particular how you keep people at your door, you ain't. For two pence I'd have sported it or burst it open with my foot. Why, the old mummy was fast asleep, returned the resurrection man, and I was upstairs trying to awake her, but I didn't expect you till tomorrow night. No, and we shouldn't have come either, said the cracksman, if there hadn't been thirty quids to earn tonight. The devil there is, cried the resurrection man. Then you ain't come for the stiffens tonight. No such thing, the sawbones, that is... The... No such thing. The sawbones that it's for don't expect it till tomorrow night, so it's no use taking it. But there are other sawbones, which lives down by the Middlesex Hospital, which will meet us at half past one at the back of Shoreditch Church. What, tonight? said the resurrection man. Tonight in half an hour and with all the tools returned the cracksman. You'll remember a resurrection man is someone who digs up bodies from a cemetery and then sells them or uses them for other like criminal activities. So they're going to go to the churchyard at Shoreditch Church, which was mentioned a little bit earlier, and dig somebody up. Okay, um... Work for the inside of the church, he says, added the buffer. Thirty quid isn't to be sneezed at. That a ten piece. I'm blowed if I don't like this here resurrection business better than cracking ribs. What do you say, Tom? Anything by way of a change, particular as when we want to stiffen by a certain day and don't know in which churchyard to die for one, we hit upon the plan of catching them alive in the street. That was my idea, though, exclaimed the buffer. So they're saying, basically, if someone wants to get a fresh body and they don't know of one that's recently been buried, they just go and kill somebody. Nice guys, right? nice guys. Uh, don't you remember when we wanted to stiffen for the very same sawbones which we've got to meet presently? We waited for nearly two hours at this house door and at last we caught hold of a feller that was walking so comfortable along and looking up at the moon. And then I thought of holding him with his head downwards in a tub of water, added the cracksman, till he was drowned. That way don't tell no tales. No wound on the skin, no poison in the stomach, and there ain't too much water inside neither because the poor devils don't swallow with their heads downwards. Ah, it was a good idea, said the buffer, and now we've reduced it to a regular system. Tub of water already on the floor, hooks and cords to hold the chap's feet up to the ceiling, and then my eye, where they hangs head downwards just for all the world like the carcasses in the butcher shops if they hadn't got their clothes on. And then we precious soon takes off, but I say, old feller, said the crocs cracksman, turning to the resurrection man, who had remained silent during the collo colloquy between his two companions. What the devil are you thinking of? I was thinking, was the answer, that the sawbones that you've agreed to meet tonight want some particular body. He does, said the cracksman, and the one he wants is buried in a vault. Well and good, exclaimed the resurrection man. He is too good a customer to disappoint. We must be off at once. And a sawbones, in case you don't know, is a surgeon. The resurrection man did not for a moment doubt that Richard Markham had been killed by the blow which he had inflicted upon him with his life preserver. Which, life preserver doesn't mean like a um, life jacket. It was a, like a big stick that had 
usually a ball of like lead or some kind of really heavy like metal on the end of it. It was a weapon it's, and a nasty weapon at that. He therefore did not hesitate to undertake the business just proposed by his two confederates. He knew that whatever Richard's pockets might contain, he could rely upon the honesty of the mummy who, horrible to relate, was the miscreant's own mother. Having therefore given a few instructions in a whisper, the old woman, he prepared to the old woman, he prepared to accompany the cracksman and the buffer. The three worthies provided themselves with some of the long flexible rods and other implements before noticed, and the resurrection man took from a cupboard two boxes, each about six inches square, and which he gave to his companions to carry. He also concealed the tin shade which held the candle about his person, and these preliminaries being settled, the three men left the house. Let us now return to Richard Markham. Worried about Richard? <laughs> The moment he was deposited in the back room and the door had closed behind the occupants of that fearful den, he started up, a prey to the most indescribable feelings of alarm and horror. What a lurking hole of enormity, what a haunt of infamy, what a scene of desperate crime was this in which he now found himself. A feculent smell of the decomposing corpse in the next room reached his nostrils and produced a nauseating sensation in his stomach. And that corpse, was it the remains of one who had died a natural death or who had been most foully murdered? He dared not answer the question which he had thus put to himself. He feared lest the solution of that mystery might prove ominous in respect to his own fate. Ah, for the means of escape. He must fly. He must fly from that horrible sink, sink of crime, from that human slaughterhouse. But how? The door was locked and the window was closed with a shutter. If he made the slightest noise, the ruffians in the next room would rush in and assassinate him. But hark, those men were talking and he could overhear all they said. Could it be possible the two who had just come were going to take the third away and with them upon his own revolting business? Hope returned to the bosom of the poor young man. He felt that he might be saved. But, oh, horror, on what topic had the conversation turned? Those men were rejoicing in their own infernal inventions to render murder unsuspected. The object of the tub of water and the hooks and cords upon the ceiling were now explained. The unsuspecting individual who passed the door of that accursed dwelling by night was set upon by the murderers, dragged into the house, gagged and suspended by his feet to these hooks while his head hung downwards in the water. And thus he delivered up his last breath, and the wretches kept him there until decomposition commenced, and the corpse might not appear too fresh to the surgeon to whom it was to be sold." Merciful heavens could such things be. Could atrocities of so appalling a nature be perpetrated in a great city protected by thousands of well-paid police? Could the voice of murder, murder affected with so much safety, cry up to heaven for vengeance through the atmosphere of London? At length the three men went out, as before described, and Markham felt an immense weight suddenly lift from his mind. Before the resurrection man set out upon his excursion with the cracksman and the buffer, he had whispered these words to the mummy— while I'm gone, you can clean out the swell's pockets in the back room. He's got about 400 or 500 pounds on him, so mind and take care. When you've searched his pockets, strip him and look at his skull. I'm afraid I fractured, fractured it, for my life preserver came down precious heavy upon him, and he never spoke a word. If there's the wound, I must bury him tomorrow in the cellar. If not, wash him clean, and I know where to dispose of him. <laughs> oh, man. This was in obedience to these instructions. It was in obedience to these instructions that the mummy took a candle in her hand and proceeded to the back room as soon as her son and his two companions had left the house. The horrible old woman was not afraid of the dead. Her husband had been a resurrection man and her only son followed the same business. She was therefore too familiar with the sight of death in all its most fearful as well as its most interesting shapes to be alarmed at it. The revolting spectacle of a corpse putrid with decomposition produced no more impression upon her than the pale and beautiful remains of any lovely girl whom death had called early to the tomb and whose form was snatched from its silent couch beneath the sod ere the finger of decay had begun its ravages. The hideous old woman considered corpses an article of commerce. Mud handled her wares as a trader does his merchandise. She cared no more for the sickly and fetid odor which they sent forth than the tanner does for the smell of the tan yard or the scourer for the fumes of his bleaching liquid. The mummy entered the back room holding a candle in her hand. Markham started forward and caught her by the wrist. She uttered a sort of growl of savage disappointment but gave no sign of alarm. Vile wretch, exclaimed Richard, God has, to, has at length sent me to discover and expose your crimes. Don't do me any harm, don't hurt me, said the old woman, and I will do anything you want of me. Answer me, cried Markham, that corpse in the other room. Murdered by my son, replied the hag, and the clothes, where are the clothes? They may contain some papers which may throw a light upon the name and residence of your victim. Follow me, I will show you. I don't know if I'd follow her. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to get out of here and send the police to sort this out. Oh, but I'm kind of a wimp. 
The old woman turned and walked slowly out of the room. Markham went after her, for he thought that if he could discover who the unfortunate person was that had met his death in that accursed dwelling, he might be enabled to relieve his family at least from the horrors of suspense, although he should be the bearer of fatal news indeed. The mummy opened the door of a cupboard formed beneath the staircase, and holding forward the light, pointed to some clothes which hung upon a nail inside. There, take him yourself if you want him, said the old woman. I won't touch him. With these words, she drew back, but still held the candle in such a way as to throw the light into the closet. Markham stepped forward to reach the clothes, and in extending his hand to take them from the peg, he advanced one of his feet upon the floor of the closet. <gasps> a trap door instantly gave way beneath his feet. He lost his balance and fell precipitately into a subterranean excavation. <laughs> he needs Eliza there. She knows how to get out. <laughs> The trap door, which moved with a spring, closed by itself above his head, and he heard the triumphant cackling laugh of the old hag as he fastened it with a large iron bolt. The mummy then went and seated herself by the corpse in the front room, and while she rocked backwards and forwards in her chair, she crooned a song. We must leave the mummy singing her horrible staves and accompany the body snatchers in their proceedings at Shoreditch Church. <gasps> okay, that's the end of the chapter. Man! <laughs> Richard just can't win. Okay, I'm assuming he will somehow come out of this okay because he's one of our, like, main people, but, oh, my word, another murder house. Another murder house! Okay, we will check back in for the next chapter and see what happens.